This is a learn from your peers um, um, conversation around what it's um, kind of the, the ins and outs of training today, um, what you can learn from the challenges that, that your peers have faced uh, in the market, um, in their own organizations, and what they have done to uh, address some of those challenges and think of new ways in, in handling that. And of course, how uh, Wilson Allen has, has been able to, to help them. Um, but, but we're here to learn from them. So I wanna introduce our panel. Um, with us, we have Lori House. She's the uh, CIO and Director of Marketing at McKinsey Lake. So welcome, Lori. Also, we have Deb Olson Bush. She, she's the lead trainer for, for Baker Hostetler. Um, thank you as well, Deb, for joining us. And, and also my colleague, Mr. John Attinger. He is our Senior Director of Learning and Development here at Wilson Allen. Um, so we've got that established that we're focusing in on some of the challenges that, that our, our, our um, customers are facing in the market. Um, and we wanna help provide some insights as how they've kind of focused on those challenges, set goals to overcome them, um, engage and service their, their organizations from a training or learning and adoption program. So um, I'm gonna start it off with a question uh, for you, Deb, and, and I really wanna get into kind of what are the goals within Baker Hostetler around learning and development and, and how have those goals changed, right? You know, we know a lot has happened over the last couple of years. And um, it would be good to understand, you know, what are those challenges? How have they changed? And, um, you know, what, what, what have you faced uh, as, it, as it comes to training within your organization? So if you wouldn't mind, Deb, giving us a little bit of background on, on yours, your situation. Thanks, Justin. Well, at the beginning of 2020, our managing partner, Paul Schmidt, introduced a five-year strategic plan for our firm. And this was beginning before pandemic. So he laid out this beautiful plan of 11 overall strategic goals for our, our firm. Two of those goals had to do with talent and technology. So imagine having this beautiful, well laid out plan and then two and a half months later, the pandemic hits. And um, that was uh, a struggle, but um, our firm had already uh, embraced remote learning. So we didn't have as much difficulty as a lot of other firms did. But I think our biggest challenge um, is that all of our training initiatives that our team undertakes have to be aligned back to our firm's strategic plan. So we always ask the questions, will the training program increase the talent at the firm? And will the training bolster the efficient use of technology at the firm? And so everything that we do now is driven through those two questions. Lori, maybe a little bit of background on your on yours is: Do you have similar challenges? Have you have you faced um, anything in in particular around work from home, remote working, the pandemic? Just give us some insights about McKinsey Lake. Um, well, maybe just a little bit about our our program as well. I, I mean, similar to Deb, um, we set about some uh, strategic initiatives a number of years ago and one of which included the development of a new continuous learning and development plan. Um, because we, we recognized that that was going to be needed in order to create advantages for our people, our firm, and of course our clients. So um, we actually revamped and relaunched a new program about five years ago. Um, and you know the primary goal of our program um, has always been to uh, provide kind of core technology training skills, those core competencies that are needed um, to have a program that engages our people, 
um, you know, a program that appeals to a, a different learning audience, a program that's easy to digest and consumable. And, and all of that is really about trying to ensure our people have a, a, the same level of core technical competencies from which we can then build um, through upskilling and other programs. So that was the, the plan that we had set out. Um, and of course, uh, like Deb, uh, COVID came along and, um, you know, through, through a wrench into the picture, um, I think, you know, for the most part, um, we've been able to continue to function. Our, um, our program was very much uh, hybrid already. So it consisted of kind of instructor led uh, e-learning and on-demand content. So the pivot for us when COVID hit, uh, was really only to pivot from instructor-led um, to instructor-led via remote. So uh, we were pretty fortunate in that regard. John, just to give you a chance to talk early on here, um, can you talk about maybe some of the customers we have faced and, and discussed with and, and maybe some of their challenges? Uh, does, does this ring true? It, it, it always seems like we can come back to the pandemic and it's it's kind of a it's an easy benchmark for all of us to think about what has changed in the world. No, nothing bigger has changed, at least in my lifetime, than, than the pandemic around how I work and how I operate. But but is this true in the larger scheme? Uh, yeah, yeah. What you're hearing from from both Deb and Lori is, is, is kind of emblematic of what's going on across law firms in general. Um, I, I would echo that it depends, I would echo what Deb said, that it depends on the level of your build out of remote training, remote working, how nimble you were, as it were, before, as to how much of, a, of, a, of an electrocution shock it was when everything came closed. Um, obviously, if you had those systems in place, then it was just a matter of tweaking it. If you didn't, then you were running like crazy. Um, but yeah, absolutely. What I, what I hear from Deb and Lori is echoed with almost all of the firms that I've talked with. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I've been interviewing uh, a number of, of CFOs, CIOs within, within our customer base recently. And we talked about a number of challenges, uh, but, but, but the, there was one that kind of rang true almost consistently was, was talent retention, right? And there was a, an increase focused on, on learning and development as one of the levers to be, to be utilizing to, to help retain, uh, retain talent. And I think, Lori, you, you were talking about how do we have a proper engagement that, that, that they feel like their skills, their base skills can, can be established, and then you build an upskilling program on top of that. These are all questions that were on their minds. Um, and John, you actually sent me over this morning a, a study that said that, you know, a, a training program helps retain customers by 50%. So, and it wasn't just about a training program. It was about a, a true learning program, one that's not weak, but a stronger one, right? And, and so I thought, I thought that was pretty uh, resonant to, to what, what, what I was hearing. Um, so, so Lori, I'll go, I'll go to you. Is there, has there been an impact of, we, we like to call it the great resignation. I, I, I mean, I'm not married to that term, but, but I think it's something we can relate to. Is that something that you guys have, have found as a challenge and, and is, is your learning and development program geared in some way to, to, to help reduce maybe that impact? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we've been pretty fortunate not to have been hugely impact, um, impacted by resignations. I, I mean, certainly we've had a few over the course of the, the last couple of years. I think that's pretty normal. Um, I think what we're actually seeing now is uh, more unplanned early retirements. Um, and, you know, people that have um, made it through the last two years and were close to retiring have kind of said, you know, enough is enough and, and uh, they're leaving early. So, um, so we, we, we are facing that. Um, 
I think, you know, the biggest issue for, for us and certainly in southwestern Ontario is um, we're not competing, people aren't competing for jobs, we're competing against each other, like organizations are competing for the talent. Um, and, and people just, you know, over the last couple of years, they either moved or they didn't move. And uh, so finding experienced, capable people has been incredibly challenging. Um, so, you know, I, I think with that regard, your learning and development program is, is one piece of that giant puzzle in terms of retention and acquisition. But I mean, there's certainly key areas that your um, program can focus on, you know, ensuring that um, it's flexible so that you can pivot um, when things change in the market or within your organization. Um, I think you have to be committed to reviewing and revising because um, plans need to change as your content changes and, and maybe as your, your organization's goals change as well. Um, and I think you need to engage your stakeholders, make sure you're getting feedback from them to understand what's working and what's not working. Um, and, and because that engagement is pretty critical. I think to just, um, you know, one of the things that's really worked well for us, and it seems simple, is, you know, really focusing on that first impression. Um, you know, onboarding a new employee is a pretty um, complex project. There's a lot of moving pieces. So we've, we've made a really big effort to ensure that that process is wholesome and as seamless as possible. And first impressions go a long way. Um, you know, so when that person, you know, joins your firm and, and lands in your reception on day one, if all the experience they have had up until then, then has been uh, smooth and uh, seamless, it, it's, it's a positive thing. So anyways, I think there's a lot of things that we can do to continue to make sure our plans, you know, engage our people and, um, you know, keep our talent. Um, one of the things we did was expanded our educational program this year to include a, an assistance program, for example, which um, for eligible employees gives them funding uh, to attend training outside of what we do uh, in the firm. So um, again, that's something that works both towards acquisition as well as retention. Yeah. You know, I, I was thinking about as you were as you were talking, like that first impression, you know, we see I don't know if you guys are on, on LinkedIn much, but I, you know, as people were moving into to new positions, I saw a lot of, you know, care packages coming to their home, like their first day, they got their t-shirt, they got their cup, like a very warm welcome to the organization. I'm sure that's a big challenge for work from home environments, but, but it makes a good first impression. Like it, it, they, they were proud to, to, to show it, you know, on, on, on at least the, uh, on the social media. Right. So it, it does make it, it makes a difference. So, um, you do want to feel welcome. And I think that is, that is truly, truly first impressions are hard to get over, aren't they? Um, Deb, I'm curious, um, just back to kind of the, the great resignation concept. Um, you know, you guys do a lot of uh, directed and, and focus training around practice areas and stuff like that. Um, but, but is this a, is this a challenge in, in the Baker Hustetler world? Have, have you seen anything like this? And, and how, how have you guys directed on the training side uh, to help with that? Well, both on the training side and just for practice groups in general, um, the firm has uh, started working on this plan uh, for our associates uh, which is called the work allocation. And so what it does is it takes our first through fourth year associates and they fill out every week a what's their hours of availability for the next week to work on any matters that a partner may need help with. And they get not only to say, look, I'm available, but they also get to say what type of work they are they would like to do and they want to do more of. And so it's monitored um, so that our associates, we're making sure that everybody gets a shot at the big cases or the things that interest them. And I think that has 
that is going to make a great impact on our ability to retain our talent because we're listening to those associates and we're able to provide them with the type of work that they are wanting to do. So I think that helps. Um, as far as technology goes, we have to constantly look at our practice groups and we do work with uh, either local practice groups or we work on specific, uh, more broad, our nationwide practice groups. And we try to get a better sense of the work that they do. And then we discuss that with the other trainers and like, how can we leverage technology to streamline their processes, help them achieve their goals, to be able to do analysis quicker and at the drop of the hat. And I, I think it's made them more successful. And I don't think they want to leave that behind because they don't always get that in other places. That's a fascinating, I, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know that. So for anybody out there thinking we, we've rehearsed this, we, we have not. Uh, so that was fascinating to learn, Deb, and I, I really appreciate that. It almost is a differentiation, right? Like it's, 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 it could almost become a recruiting tool, it sounds like. Hey, you get options and, and you get to work on things that you're interested in, in addition to, to learning the, the Baker Hostetler way. That's, that's really fascinating. John, any, have you heard of anything like that before? Yeah, we actually, I have seen that in a number of organizations. And in fact, Don Cardoza, who's on the call here today, said that they have an in-house built work app, work allocation app the same at Lowenstein. So it's, it really is becoming a way of making sure that those folks who are getting ramped into the firm are getting what they want so that they can build out their own interests in their own career. Thanks, Don. Yeah, that's that. That was great, and thank you, Don, for that that comment. That's really that's really interesting. Um, we've been talking about work from home a little bit here, but but I'm fa I'm I'm fascinated by this because I think I think it's a it's a monumental shift in in some industries, and you know I think the idea of an associate partner relationship being able to walk down the hallway or, or be in close proximity is now being replaced by by technology in a, in a lot of ways. Have you guys, as you think about the deployment of you know, a virtual collaboration, have you found successes in that? And, and has your training program been able to de help deliver on some of that success? Um, and maybe some of the challenge, maybe it's not all the way there yet, but, but I'm curious to get some thoughts on that. So Deb, if maybe you could, I'll, I'll, I'm going back and forth, so I'll just ping back and forth that way. So that maybe you could give me some thoughts on, on kind of that virtual collaboration and how that's impacted your training program and success? Well, for us, um, we had been doing remote training before the pandemic, so that, that was an easy process, but we moved to Teams during this pandemic also. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a huge bolster for training because we had the, the chance to see our students face to face before we were just kind of a voice in the void, um, but we could see them and we could connect with them and build the relationship uh, with those attorneys and staff. And they started to see us as a human being and we could see them as a human being. And we built better connections to where you had more vested in each other. And I think that has helped us. Um, our biggest challenge was getting enough headsets and with microphones on them to get started with it all. But other than that, I think that the use of the, the remote learning um, and the use of teams where we can see each other and make that personal connection, I find that our attorneys reach out to us 
at more often even now that's that will even say look I don't know how to do this can you kind of just quickly show me how to get through this and we have these little training moments uh, throughout the day so it's not as scheduled as it used to be that's interesting and 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 Laurie I'm I'm interested from your purview you know obviously enabling work from home relationships as, as well as as well as getting everybody up to speed what what has been um, the experience at McKinsey Lake yeah I, I mean I think certainly um, you know the transition to work from home um, was actually fairly smooth for us I mean um, we certainly had some hiccups where um, you know technology, um, you know, not having dual monitors or, and, uh, you know, just issues and headsets like what Deb said. Um, so, I mean, for that part, um, we did okay. And because our training program was really already uh, work from home friendly, I mean, you could do it from within the office, you could um, do it anywhere from home. And, and um, so they were, they were used to being able to, to work on it when it made most sense. Um, it worked well, and, and like Deb, uh, we also rolled out teams um, as part of our uh, COVID planning. Um, I mean, we had an intranet uh, that we use kind of as a, a social hub, um, but teams definitely improved, um, you know, communications and uh, worked in favor for training. And um, we used it as well to, you know, pair up uh, our mentors because a big part of our training in the past had been always to um, schedule in time with mentors. Uh, so, you know, maybe you're in training in the morning and in the afternoon you were doing kind of in the flow training, which means you had an opportunity to use the skills that you had learned in the morning and work with your mentor uh, to understand, you know, what you were doing right and what you were doing wrong. And of course, when COVID hit, that became a bit of a challenge. So um, teams certainly helped to facilitate um, that collaboration. Um, you know, remote is not the same as the in-person interaction for sure, but um, I think it's, it's certainly improved the situation. Did, did you feel that because it was a pandemic, because it's, there was a lot of um, uh, maybe a, a little bit of grace that was given because, you know, hey, we're all in this together kind of thing that, that you know, we knew there would be hiccups. Did you, did you feel like there was a, a level of, hey, you know, we're, we're, we'll make it through this and, and that helped kind of build that like easy transition? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I think our lawyers and staff usually have pretty high expectations of what the technology and the learning uh, department deliver. Um, but I do believe everybody um, was more accepting of the hiccups. Um, and, and um, you know, so, I mean, everything was positive in that regard. And um, if we came across challenges, we just worked on them together. But um, for the most part, I think things went rather smoothly. That's good. That's good. We were talking about our favorite shows and Ted Lasso came up right before we joined this, this, uh, this webinar. And, and we talked about his character and his, his easygoing and, and his kind of good hearted nature. And I think we all had a little bit of a, we had to have a little bit of a good heart as we went through that because we're, we, it certainly was unprecedented to, to, to us. So um, yeah, I, I was just curious to, to hear if that was part of, part of that experience. Um, just shifting a little bit, um, as you think about, we're, we're on this call for, for a reason, right, together. Um, I'm curious, and, and I'll start with you, Lori, going backwards again. Um, what were, so as you, as you started to make decisions around changing some of your learning program and looking at staffing alternatives, what, 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 were, you, what were your goals? What were you, what were you trying to achieve in that? What were your challenges that you were trying to overcome in, in, in looking at alternatives? Yeah, I think, well, you know, I think our goals remain the same. You know, our aim has always been on um, improving the technical competencies for our lawyers and staff and, and giving everyone kind of a, that opportunity to grow and stretch. Um, but, 
you know, some of the challenges we had as a smaller firm um, uh, and a smaller IT team um, is resources. Um, you know, we had a single dedicated trainer on our team, and unfortunately, she was a casualty of COVID. Uh, we lost her mid-COVID, um, not to a competitor, but um, to a, a learning management platform, actually. So I, and that was a big hit for us. Um, because there were lots of new hires in the pipeline. Um, and we all know how important it is to have um, fulsome training before people hit the ground running. And uh, if we didn't put a solution in place, you know, it was going to be a combination of my IT manager and myself and a few other IT members that were going to be doing the training. And uh, that's not necessarily ideal. So our first challenge was we lost our trainer. Our second challenge was, you know, we knew that finding experienced legal trainers in this area um, was, was a challenge. Um, there just wasn't a lot of lateral movement in that regard. And uh, we, we knew we needed to kind of meet some upcoming demands. So those were the primary challenges we had. Plus, I think just being a smaller firm, um, you know, our, our trainer at the time had always been involved primarily with onboarding and then, of course, projects and, and special rollouts. And so working on the development and execution of upskilling programs always seemed to fall on the back burner. And um, so we, we know we really wanted to focus on ramping that up as part of our overall program. And uh, so that was another challenge. And those were the primary reasons that led us to, you know, the decision we made to work with managed training services. Okay. Great. Thank you, Lori. Deb, you had a little bit of a different program because it's, you, you, you still have a training department. Um, what, what led you to, to think about alternatives on the Baker Hostetler side? Well, the trainers were trying to um, kind of expand their, their toolkit and what we could offer to the firm. And um, we've got a firm over 1,700, um, and we have three trainers to handle all 1,700, and we've got 17 offices across the U.S. So having three people to handle everybody and all the initiatives uh, got to be a challenge. And we were always trying to help in other areas with the different projects. And it seemed like the onboarding every week was pulling us away from that. And the onboarding stayed consistent. It's the same classes. It's the same material. And so it seemed logical then as to adding to our head count, which we didn't want to do, was to bring in people who were legal industry familiar mm -hmm. and who were trainers who could fill that role, who understood how a law firm works and so understood the types of people and personalities and the type of work that these people were going to be doing. And so it what just made sense for us to be able to pull from a pool instead of have a one trainer. So a third of your workforce is gone, call in sick, and then the other two are trying to figure out if their schedules could fill that class or even worse, have to cancel one. So we always knew that we had, um, with bringing this, these trainers in to handle these consistent classes, it just made really good sense. So tell me then, like when you go to looking at, you know, a partner um, to what, what were you looking for? Right. So, so you talk about not wanting to hire somebody, but, but you said, Hey, you know, we have, uh, we have a need and we want to fulfill it. What, what, what were you looking for in a, in a partner and, and what were kind of the pros and cons you weighed to, to making a decision? Well, first you always think about the, the, um, the round hole and the square peg. 
And we needed somebody who recognized what our business needs were and how our firm functioned to be able to adapt around that. We didn't, we didn't want to have to shave our corners off to fit in with that partner. We needed that partner to understand our business, how we worked and shape um, those resources around that. And, and you know, was, was cost savings a part of your pros and cons here? Is it, it, it was it? Oh, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. I mean, the headcount, adding in headcount, we did not want to have to do. The budget would not allow for that. But the cost savings over just having people handle these specific classes for us was uh, truly the one of the biggest benefits. Okay. Good. Good. How about you, Lori? What about you guys? What, what, what made you think about a partner and what were the pros and cons you guys weighed? Yeah, I think, um, you know, similar to Deb, um, we, we were looking for someone that um, was experienced in legal training. Um, you know, having had new trainers in, in, you know, many times before, if you bring somebody in, they can be an experienced trainer, but if they don't know legal, your ramp up time can be like six months. So it's a long haul. So uh, we were looking for someone that was experienced. Um, we were definitely looking for someone that could scale with our needs um, and be flexible. Um, you know, in January, we had a small firm that joined us. So, um, you know, we had 14 people to train in a week. Um, maybe not uh, a big big task for a firm of dead size, but that's huge for us. Um, so we needed some scalability and familiarity and um, just, you know, kind of experience. Um, that's really what we were looking for. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and were you guys, when you think about the... Um, Justin, you're on mute. I'm on mute. You can't hear me now. Now we can hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, I took myself off mute. Um, <laughs> maybe it took a minute. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, thank you for sharing that. I mean, I think one of the things that we, we look for in, in, this, in what we've been hearing from, uh, from others is, is very similar, right? You know, is, is finding the talent, getting them on board, and I think even, you know, if I could, you know, some of the some of the challenges that I've heard is, hey, we get them on board, we, we get them up and running, you know, take six months, and then somebody hires them away from us, right, you know, the, the firm down the street or, or whoever, right. Um, so there's, there's always that 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 has come into play. Um, so, so let's, let's switch. So, so you guys made a decision to work with with Wilson Allen on, on these managed training services, um, I'm curious. So, so Deb, you're you're much further along. You've been working with with the team in, in this capacity for for well over a year now. I'm I'm curious, how's it going? I, I I know others are as well, right? I think there's an element of how. Okay, this all sounds great, but but tell us how's it going? What what are the things that Work. What are the challenges that you you faced? Um, just give them give give the audience a little bit of insights as to how this all went. Uh, well, I'll say that it's going quite well. Um, one of the things that um, our firm enjoys with working with the Wilson Allen um, trainers is the fact that we have a pool of trainers that work directly with us. And so there, there's always somebody there. Um, so we really have three people to replace one human being. So no matter what time of day or uh, class that they need to train, um, they work that. They, they find the way to work that. And we have, we, like I say, we have the same people over and over again. So that continuity helps. Um, not only that, but you build kind of a bond with these trainers. And it's sometimes hard for me to think of them as an outside resource because they have um, 
they understand our goals, they understand our needs, and they can react to that. And in some cases, they've even made suggestions uh, for some changes. And I would go, sure, I mean, that's a great idea. Let's go with that, let's try that. So that's helped a lot. And again, it's always that Wilson Allen works with our parameters. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really important part. And I'll, I'll have John talk about our parameters here here in a moment. But Lori, you're you're earlier in in this relationship, and I think it's important for uh, people to understand. Okay, well, what's it like to get up and running? You know, Deb's got Deb showed some or talked about some experiences of like an ongoing relationship and what that's been like. But what's it been like for you to to ramp up and actually start to engage with um, the managed training offering? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's been a great experience, first and foremost. Um, you know, I think we've been at it now for about six months. I, I'm, I'm not sure. John can probably correct me. But um, so we have now um, kind of completed the, the onboarding process. So our um, trainers um, are, you know, good to go. We leave them on their own. Um, they 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 do our onboarding training, they do our evaluations and our two week, you know, touch points with our new hires. Um, and then we touch base with them to understand if there's any issues or follow ups that that are needed. So we're about halfway through our program. The next focus for us is going to be on working on the upskilling. So we've already started to uh, kind of, you know, draft that list of, of content. Um, and we're working on that. So all said and done, things have been going really well. Um, I, I think the biggest thing people have to understand if they're looking down this um, path is that it's a lot of work up front. Um, don't underestimate the amount of work up front. Um, you know, you have to pull all your resources together. You need to review those resources with the, the, the trainers from MTS. Um, you need to discuss them, you need to sit and teach back sessions to make sure that the trainers are training, you know, in, in ways that are accurate or reflective of your environment. Um, and we even went so far as to then sit in on sessions where the trainers taught new people, um, kind of the first couple uh, sets of, of onboarding. So it's a big commitment. Um, but in the end, um, you have, uh, you know, a trainer or we have two dedicated trainers that are available to us that know our system really well. Um, and, and, you know, we actually have a revised kind of script of our training um, and that is reflective and accurate and up to date, uh, which is, which is great. Um, I would say the only thing that, um, you know, is, is, a, is missing a little bit with our plan in that, although, like Deb said, um, the trainers know our environment now, getting to know our people, and, and for the most part, anybody that has them or works with them wouldn't know that they're not an employee of Mackenzie Lake, but they don't always know process. Um, so, for instance, you know, this is how I do this in the real estate department, well, this is how we do it in the family law department. Those types of things aren't necessarily covered off by you know, onboarding training. So you have to be prepared to backfill um, those responsibilities. Um, so with either mentors or, or um, you know, members of your IT team. So um, there is a bit of a gap um, that still needs to be filled, but um, for the most part, it's, it's worked really well. And we've been very pleased, for sure. Good, good. And and feedback from from the learners are they? What, what, how, how has that been positive? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we're just going down that path, and and um, we're you know changing that feedback, um, the questions that we're asking as we go, um, as our environment changes as well. But yes, for the most part, um, you know, it's good. Um, you know, they. They give us critical feedback and, and we take that feedback into consideration and and when it makes sense, we make changes to the program, um, you know, to, to benefit our end people, our, our end users. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And John, I, I, I'll, I'll, you know, in the last couple minutes that we have here, I think it's important for um, 
anybody who might be interested or, or just kind of hearing about this is, you know, what are the highlights of, of a learning and development program such as this? And, and maybe giving them a sense of how we as a, as a group approach them, like what is day, day one through day 30 with, with the customers? Sure. Thanks, Justin. Mm -hmm. um, and thanks very much, Deb and Lori, for all of the valuable insights you've been able to give. Um, so as you've heard, the process of, of working with a new client, um, if you want to call it day one through day 30, um, one of our lead trainers will work with the, the client with you. Um, and as you heard them say, to develop the goals for your program, right? We, we really view training from the perspective of performance consulting, not just features and functions, ribbons and, and menus. Um, if anybody remembers what a menu is. Uh, we look at identifying business goals. Um, what are some of the, the as, as Lori talked about, the practice specific needs? Um, what are your pain points? And then we wanna design a solution that really helps contribute to the success of the firm around solving those issues and, and solving those problems. So we spend a significant amount of time, as Lori described, getting to know the organization to the extent that we can, right? We're not living in the real estate group or the or the whatever it, it, the, it may be, but as much of that as we can absorb through knowledge transfers, through an understanding of the policies, um, and that obviously will grow over time. And then we work to de design a program that attacks those goals and solves them for you. Um, we obviously want to look at what the current training program looks like. Um, there's a structure there. Can we make it any better? Can we improve it anyway? Can we build it out with some of the full blended offering offerings that may not be available right now, whether it's e-learning, whether it's training tools, whether it's just-in-time support tools, whether it's evaluation tools. Lori was talking about wanting to implement a skill-up program. So we have school, we have tools that allow for that kind of evaluation to take place. And, and Janice, um, our director of consulting, has worked with lots of firms on skilling up and how to do that in a productive, positive, uplifting way. Um, and then we always encourage our, our clients to parse out the training. And, and in both cases with, with Deb and Lori, traditionally you, you, you often hear about new hire training as, all right, it's Monday, you're gonna get fire hosed and you're gonna get overwhelmed with information and you've got one and a half days to suck it up and then bye bye baby. Um, we really encourage organizations to parse that over days and weeks and months. And, and you heard about touch points at two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. The more of that you can build in, the better, so that we're providing the foundation and then it continues to grow as the need grows because you just, you know, the cup runneth over. Mm -hmm. um, and then as, as you heard from Laurie, the final element of that process is for us to actually recapitulate the training for you so that you get a chance to be a new hire and see what it's like and make adjustments and tweaks. And I think it's also, you talk about the feedback loop. What, what, what does the program do specifically around getting, getting feedback about the effectiveness of, of the training and the program itself? Yeah, good question. So <clears throat> as you've heard, and as I've said, part of the, the initial setup phase is to really look at what are some of these pain points? What are the goals? Um, once the, the program is ongoing, then we meet with you every couple of weeks, we have a, a, a short touch point meeting. Uh, what's going on? How are things going? And we look back and we decide, okay, how are we doing in our, uh, our attempt, our, our, our goals setting? Where have we come? What do we need to do? Also, what changes might need to be done? Um, both Lori and Deb, the, the process of, of getting feedback from the users, we strongly encourage survey forms so that you can find out right at the point of need, how are people feeling that this training is going? Um, and so we, we'd like to, to get information that we can from there. Also, suggestions are, let's, let's find out what the help desk tickets are. Let's, let's get reports from the help desk and maybe on a, on a quarterly basis, look at those to see, do we need to make any tweaks or adjustments or, or provide any ad hoc training? Um, and then what we like to do as well is maybe every six months or every nine months, 
do what we call a look back, look forward meeting where we say, okay, how have we come? And what do we need to do? What, what do you see in the future that we might need to change? Mm -hmm. Seems very data driven. So like actually using feedback yeah. and not just broadcasting. Yeah. 